right, everyone. We I think what we're going to do is is get underway, and um, we hope that Leonard Doyle will join us. Um, and then we'll just have to fill him in on what we've talked about so far. Apparently, the Victoria Line, did any of you try to use the Victoria Line? Apparently, it's down, or there's a problem. Maybe that's how it came. Can you hear me? Is that all right now? I just wasn't using it properly. Well, welcome uh, to you all t for this really first editor's roundtable. Tonight, um, it's a foreign editor's roundtable or foreign editor's roundtable, since we um, are very pleased indeed to have Harriet Sherwood, the foreign editor of The Guardian, with us tonight. Um, before we get underway to talk about uh, the conversation about um, her job and the kinds of choices that uh, foreign editors have to make these days, how many of you are aware of what appears to be the good news about Alan Johnston? Um, late this afternoon, uh, it was reported uh, that um, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, says he has reliable information from his intelligence services that he's alive. So that is um, a very good news indeed to start this evening. And also to tell you that next week on the 25th, we're going to do an evening to talk about those circumstances and also to talk about the predicaments for local journalists who have not had the prominence when we talk about uh, journalists held hostage. And uh, we want to talk about the responsibility of major news organizations toward those local journalists. And that will be the subject for next week. Um, if uh, Leonard was here, which he's not. He's on his way, actually. I just spoke to his colleagues. He's not the sources, but he's in the tube. Okay. So, He'll join us. But, I mean, even though one would think that uh, the Guardian Independent would see things pretty much the same way, they didn't certainly this morning if you looked at the coverage. The coverage today of Cho the Shooter, as he's being called in the States, um, a front page picture and story by the Guardian. That dominates the front page in addition to some other stories we'll talk about. But in the Independent, Baghdad. And the Independent making the statement that while the world was focused on what was happening at Virginia Tech. In fact, it was a day of absolute bloodshed and mayhem in Baghdad and 200 died. That was their editorial statement. So I guess we get right away to the issue of choices and how those choices happen and the role of the foreign editor in trying to make those choices and argue for those choices inside their own news organizations. How did you – was this an obvious choice? Was this an obvious thing to do, uh, Harriet? Or – were you, uh, were you the voice in the editorial meeting saying, don't forget this, and you lost out? Um, no choices are obvious when it comes to uh, daily newspapers, or very rarely they're obvious. Um, yesterday was a difficult day, um, and uh, we talked quite a lot both on the desk with my colleagues and with the editor of the day about what we were going to put on the front page. Um, and um, we were very conscious that... Um, well, I mean, the, the numbers changed. Uh, you know, they kept, kept growing during the course of the day. But we, from lunchtime onwards, we were very conscious that there had been an absolutely appalling um, scene in uh, the uh, Sadria market in Baghdad and several other incidents around the city as well where um, huge numbers of people have been killed. And um, we were very anxious to give that... Um, uh, good coverage in the paper and um, I was very conscious of the um, parallels um, with the situation in Virginia um, which obviously has had kind of saturation coverage this week um, and um, we had quite a lot of discussion, I had quite a lot of discussion with my, with my colleagues on the foreign desk about the issues that come into play when you're reporting or deciding how to um, report on these, these kind of varying, various um, different um, events. Um, and, um, I mean, you know, I can, go, I can go through that and say that um, the thing about, um, I mean, I think the thing that happened in Baghdad yesterday was appalling because of the numbers, but the truth is it's an everyday occurrence. Um, you know, every day people are killed in Baghdad and it goes, much of it goes unreported in the uh, British press, the Western press, and I think that's something that is 
very worthy of debate and discussion, and I hope we'll kind of explore that a bit further. In terms of the specific choices about the front page, um, we, were, we, we were keen. I mean, we, we decided that we wanted to go with a story about uh, Boris Berezovsky um, because this is a story that we had um, uh, kicked off when we had an interview with Berezovsky last week when he said that he wanted to ferment revolution, or in fact he was fermenting revolution in Russia, and uh, we've kind of continued with it ever since. So we had our own line on that story. Um, and in fact, the pictures of Cho didn't come until um, after first edition. Um, we decided that we would do a thousand words on Baghdad on page three. Um, I think that um, at one point we talked about doing a piece on the front as well, which would have been a shorter piece cross-referring to the page three thing. Um, and, um, you know, that was something that I was quite keen on. In the end, um, the front page was a compote of three different stories, and we put the Baghdad stuff inside, and we put the bulk of our um, uh, Cho coverage, the shooter coverage, um, further back in the paper. Um, the Independent, I mean, I don't want to kind of speak for Leonard because he can speak for himself when he gets here, um, but The Independent is, you know, I'm sure you're all aware, is very much kind of one issue, front page, this is what it does, this is the, 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 the um, style it's adopted. Um, and, um, you know, I kind of, because you always try and anticipate what other papers are going to do, I kind of anticipated that they would do exactly what they did do. Um, and, you know, it's very laudable, and I think that's, I think it was a very good front page and very good coverage in The Independent. Um, if you look at the Times and the Telegraph, in fact, there was no mention of the Baghdad bombings until way back in the paper, a long way after all their uh, Virginia coverage. But, you know, so we did discuss it. I'm not sure that um, the results were... Um, you know, necessarily the right things. I mean, I think the important thing in newspapers is to say that it's very difficult to um, get it right all the time. You know, you're taking decisions up against the clock. Things are moving. Things are changing. Uh, you don't have much time. Um, that's not an excuse because, I mean, that's what we're paid to do. Um, but uh, uh, it, was, it was kind of difficult and unusual day yesterday. I mean, you know, all days are difficult to a degree. But it was – there were two powerful stories, and it was a question of, of, of how we place them in the paper. Let's talk about the pictures themselves, the video and the pictures that NBC News obtained by from Cho, which obviously, amazingly enough, were, as you know, FedEx to NBC News between the time he started shooting and continued the rampage, which is quite amazing when you think about it, remarkable. Um, was there any debate about how much of this, these pictures you should show, either on your website or a video on the website, was there anyone who was arguing that this is going to create more copycat killers? The reason I ask that question is um, the chief editor of my former organization, the CBC, made an editorial decision yesterday that they would show one picture and they would show none of the video or show none of the pictures that NBC News provided, that they would show one picture and then they would discuss what he said in summary, but they made an editorial judgment that they should not essentially provide this platform, that the emphasis should be on the victims and not turning him into some kind of celebrity hero um, in a kind of very warped way. Was there any debate about this in, in The Guardian, about what to do with these pictures? Um, well, uh, I don't know what happened last night because, as I say, all this happened fairly late on. Um, I think it was the right decision to use the picture. Um, and, in fact, in tomorrow's paper we're using quite a lot more pictures, smaller, um, but a kind of gallery of pictures of stills, obviously, from the video. Um, and we have put the video on the website um, today. So, I mean, the decision of The Guardian was that this has kind of tremendous news value, that people are um, obviously... Um, interested to know um, what his state of mind was, what, you know, whether there was any kind of explanation of um, uh, what led him to kind of commit this appalling act. Um, and you know, we have had discussion today about um, whether this does sort of play into uh, his clear desire to um, achieve notoriety. Um, and, in fact, we've, we've done a piece that's tried to address that. So, I mean, I think we debate all, all the time issues around pictures and what is permissible to show and what you shouldn't show. And I think our general position is you show as much as possible, but then you try and put that into a considered context um, and um, uh, try and explain um, or kind of talk to people about the issues around that. Um, and I think... 
you know, I'm, I'm kind of interested in CBC taking that decision because I think that's quite an unusual decision. Um, and I think most media organizations would say this has kind of tremendous news value. Would you consider the decision that he made an act of legitimate journalistic judgment to stop what he called the instant reflex of garbage in, garbage out, or was it censorship? Um, I don't think it's censorship. Um, I, that's not a word I would kind of use lightly. I think, I mean, I think there are, no, I don't, wouldn't say it was censorship. I mean, I think it's a legitimate area to um, consider really carefully. Um, I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's quite a bizarre decision for a news organization to take. Can we just stop on this point while Leonard gets here? I'd like to hear some views about this from journalists in the room to see what you think about the two things we just talked about, the use of the pictures, whether or not uh, someone would have done the same thing in your organization or whether you would associate yourself with the position taken by Tony Berman or do you think this is just simply uh, something that you can't do today? There's Leonard right there. We'll, we'll continue along here. Yes. Let's, could you identify yourself to help us here? Yeah. Hi, Leonard, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> Just to uh, fill Leonard in on where we are, we started talking about the decision made by the Independent to put Baghdad on the front page, as opposed to the Guardian and the Telegraph and everyone else to go with what happened at Virginia Tech. And we'll want to come back to how you worked that out. Uh, but then we moved on to talk about how far you go in terms of using the visuals that NBC News provided and whether or not there should be some careful thought given to how much you use those videos. I made the point that Tony Berman, the chief editor of CBC News, made the judgment not to use them and not to show them. And I was not sure when you were going to get here. So maybe, do you mind if we just, we'll hold questions just for a minute. So we've got, let's bring Leonard into this right away. So first of all, on the decision about the newspaper judgment, Harriet thought it was a crazy decision. <laughs> <laughs> Confrontation. Khan's not here tonight, so. Yes. Well, I could lie and say that we planned it and talked about it and thought it out and all the rest of it, but in truth, at the Independent, we kind of fly by wire, as they say in the aviation business. It's the Ryanair of newspapers as opposed to the um, British Airways. <laughs> we do very quick turnarounds. We do very quick turnarounds, and. Um, and sometimes, you know, we can fall on our face, and sometimes we can do very well. And, uh, but that's a function because we're a much smaller operation than The Guardian, which I used to work for and have the highest regard for, highest regard for. So why did we do this today? Well, we felt, you know, in conference that we'd been pushing, pushing hard on the, on the killing story, on the, on the VTEC story, and that give the readers a break is one thing. You know, every story has a kind of natural life cycle. Um, and Iraq is one of our sort of stronger suits, and we, Patrick was available, was around. I happened to bump into him at lunch, and Dan, my deputy, sent me a text saying there's been this appalling bombing, and I asked Patrick, could he file, and so he did. So it's not planned particularly, but it's very tightly um, kind of organized, if you like, a bit like a, I don't know, a small little football team or a theater group. Very, very tight team work as opposed to great strategy. But that was just a reflex. It was the reflex that that's where you ought to go with your view paper, your front page. Well, I mean, first of all, it became rapidly yeah. clear that this was one of the bloodiest days since the whole thing began. On the downside, we didn't have anybody in Iraq. Uh, Patrick was here at the time. Um, so that's slight negative, not, but not over, overly so, because he's a, really a world-class expert on the subject. The image was very important. And essentially, the decision is made by the editor. <laughs> do we do... HRT uh, crisis for women as a change of pace? Do we do yet another um, VTEC story? Or do we do this? And, um, or do we do climate change? <laughs> Always a good independent standby. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got so, a very good piece, piece on climate change in Bangladesh, actually, inside the paper. Exactly. You know, never let climate change out of the picture. So, so it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's a repertoire uh, that we're constantly juggling and changing and using resources which are considerably less than our main competitors. 
less in numbers, not necessarily less in skill. I mean, Patrick is a first-class you know, operator. And on the issue of how to use the video, the pictures, your website's not as ambitious as, uh, as the Guardian's website. Um, but what about the images themselves? Any, real, any, any concerns about how far to go in using those images? We were prissy about the um, Abu Ghraib images, the torture in Abu Ghraib, the people who were being, you know, trussed around and made to look appalling. And we were prissy about all sorts of things like that, you know, that does this violate the Geneva Conventions? Can we do this? And you kind of are prissy for about one edition until you see that every newspaper on the planet Earth has done it, and you quickly lose it. So you learn on the job. And in this case, I think there's also the distance between us and, uh, and the VTech business helps a lot. That decision is nearly so hard. Much more difficult decision if you're in the United States. Some of your readers are parents of, cousins of, all that. I think at, you know, at Remove, it's an easier decision to go ahead and publish them. Can you understand why the head of a major news organization, um, in this case the, the chief editor of the CBC, a very big public service broadcaster could reach the decision not to show those visuals? I think he's just plain wrong. You know. Um, let's take a couple questions on that on that issue before we move on, just because I think you wanted to ask a question about that. Identify yourself if you would. Thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Shireen Sadegi. I'm, I've worked as a producer at the BBC World Service in the America section for the last six years, and I'm also a PhD candidate at SOAS. Um, I just wanted to address because the issue of the different covers because it's really come to a point in the Western press where um, there's not much of a difference between tabloid coverage and broadsheet coverage. And um, I, with all due respect, I really don't think that what happened in Iraq yesterday is an everyday occurrence. I mean, there are people being killed in Iraq every day, but not 200. And um, frankly, I mean, I understand, I understand the... Um, market value of putting Joe on the front page of a newspaper. Um, certainly with that image with his, with his guns and he looks like that killer from the film apparently that he was obsessed with. Um, but in terms of news value, I don't see that. I don't see that at all. Um, he, uh, so my question to you is, I mean, are, as, a, as an editor who is in a position to influence society, which you are, to influence society and tell people, well, this is what's important, this is what matters to your life, this is what you need to know. How can you, like, on a daily basis, how can you um, feel comfortable with these tabloid images on your front page? Um, well, I, do, I think there is a big difference between tabloid papers and um, we can't. Sorry, we can't use this phrase tabloid anymore because um, most of the papers are tabloid. I think there is a big difference between you know what you might call the quality press um, and the popular press. And you know, actually, um, I think there's also differences within the quality press. And I think that, but I think the quality press, and by which I'm really talking about the Independent, the Guardian, the Times, and Telegraph, still does have a commitment to reporting what's happening in Iraq, and that is a kind of daily commitment, although it's extremely difficult um, to pull that off because there's kind of huge security issues and it's just very, very hard to actually get anybody um, kind of on the streets talking to Iraqis and finding out what's going on. Um, but, um, you know, I, so I don't think, I actually don't, I think, um, I think that, that if you're talking about the quality, is the quality press the same as the popular press? Clearly not. And I mean, anybody who examines um, the coverage on a kind of, you know, over a period of time would see that there are kind of absolutely major differences. I mean, the, the, the popular press doesn't cover international news at all unless it's something like what's happened in Virginia this week. Um, so, you know, that's the first point I'd um, dispute. I mean, I think that, you know, the thing about the, um, as I said before, the independent has, has um, really has a kind of one issue front page. Um, which is very powerful, um, and you know um, the, they have kind of things that they feel very passionate about. Well, I mean, I shouldn't be saying this; London should be saying it. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, it is a kind of it is a very powerful device, and I think it works very well for them. The Guardian has decided to do something very different, which is although we have shrunk in size, that actually, you know, nearly every day we have a kind of um, uh, you know two or three stories on our front page, and we kind of tend to do sort of less um, kind of shock issue. 
stuff. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, so, I mean, I would say, that, I mean, in, in, in answer to your question, I think, that, you know, I think we, are, we do have a commitment to cover it. I think it's really, really difficult. Something I, you know, I'm keen to discuss um, something that kind of occupies a lot of my time. I know it occupies a lot of my, uh, the, the time of my counterparts on other papers. Um, but I don't think we're the same as the popular press. Anyone else specifically on this issue before we move ahead? Anybody have a strong view that associates itself with um, the position of the CBC editor? Anybody here in a position of responsibility who made that same call? I, th I think the hand in the back. I think first your, your hand is up the way. Excuse me. Just wait for the microphone. Identify yourself, please. That there are so many videos broadcast of suicide bombers and the final testimonials and so on. And this seems to fall into that category. So if uh, a decision is going to be made on, on this video, then surely a similar decision would have to make, uh, be taken on uh, similar videos when it comes to suicide bombings. Do you want to put comments on it? Um, yes, hi. Um, my name's Gavin Nason. I work at the Media School at Bournemouth University. I also work with the Dart Centre for Trauma. And what I find interesting about this discussion is we always get stuck on the pictures. And while the pictures are really, really important, when you have a disaster, it's kind of a mad scramble to get the story. Um, there are other kinds of content. The people being interviewed who have gone through traumatic experiences who are being thrown into the spotlight. But I don't, I don't know CBC's coverage, but I'm assuming they, they didn't stop themselves from interviewing people who'd found themselves in positions of trauma. And so th those moments need, I think, just as much attention to get right as the photographs that you put on the papers. And one of the things that really gets to people who have been caught up in these incidents is when reporters misreport what they saw and experienced. And I think that's something that um, you know, every newspaper and every media outlet needs to take more seriously than they do at the moment. I guess there's no question there. Um, well, so as you tell answer a question and say, um, what do you think about okay. that as a well, right. <laughs> statement? <laughs> I, I think he just wanted to make a comment. Okay, is there any other? Oh, it's Paul Wood, uh, from defense correspondent for the BBC. Hi, well, since nobody's going to stick up for CBC, let me put it to you as a question in this form. By the way, I don't want to turn this into a discussion about the CBC editor. I just thought it was interesting in regard to the issue of the pictures and another point of view. So. Sure. Um, about 2004, we realized that people were being beheaded in Iraq so that the jihadist groups could get video pictures of people being beheaded out into the world's media. And at that point, people really dialed back their coverage. There was obviously for the BBC a serious taste and decency issue in showing these images. But when that awful realization came that people were being beheaded just so we would cover it, that really made us think very hard about the extent to which we did cover it. Similarly with the gunman in Virginia. If Leonard, for instance, thought that this man had done this so that these images would get shown and he would be remembered in a certain way, would that not be a very powerful argument for not showing these images so the next serial killer doesn't do it so that he will get the coverage? To some extent, but um, you kind of supposing that the little old independent has an effect on other serial killers around there. I think they go for the red tops more than they go for the independent, to be honest. But there, there is a serious side to your question, and, and I acknowledge that. If I could just return to this issue here, <clears throat> because it gets to the heart of the difference, if you like, between the independent and other media. I think it's just worth returning to for a second. What we're trying to do is differentiate ourselves from the pack, if you like. And the pack tend to, you can see what they're going to do every day, and in conference about four o'clock, we know this is the big story, this is what's going to be there, unless they have an exclusive or something different. And what we're trying to do is not shock, as somebody said. We're trying to create a discussion about something that we think is interesting and that our readers will think is interesting. And uh, I'll surprise you and tell you it's about climate change tomorrow. It's about um, Australia, the first developed country to suffer the effects of climate change by having an irrigation ban for farmers right across the country. Now, you know, there's a reluctance to go down the climate change route again, but this, we thought, is a discussion point. It's a developed country that's been re in refusal about climate change. So what we're trying to do is, not, is stay, you know, watch where the herd is going and go somewhere else, if, we, if at all possible. Let me ask, how does competition, though, affect your, de your decision about coverage? The Guardian, um, Harriet was talking about before you got here, 
had a real scoop in terms of the Berezovsky story, which influenced media around the world. Is the Independent going to be reluctant to pick up on that story because they know every time that someone picks up the story, it's going to be attributed to the Guardian because they're the ones that broke the story. Will that put you off considering giving it higher placement? Well, there are, I mean, there are different sorts of exclusives, and that was a terrific story, absolutely fantastic. There are others which just, you know, are there. Abu Ghraib is one. I mean, you know, when it happened, you couldn't get away from it, so you quickly have to get on board it and put it on the front page. Berezovsky, you can be a little bit haughty about and refer to in Dan Column and give them some recognition, but we're not going to put it on the front page. <laughs> of course not. So... I mean, that's, that's essentially how it works. And you will stay with it. Now, are you going to campaign on that story? You've got a big story. Um, it's you, You've kept it alive again today. Um, no, we're not going to campaign on it. Um, I mean, I think we will try and keep going on the story. I don't think we. I don't think campaigning is a word that we would use in reference to our news journalism. What reaction? Somebody. All right. Let's l- let's move on. Um, beyond the obvious big areas of coverage, the how do you sell your desk at a time in which, and your management, at a time when budgets are decreasing? Every, the world's exploding everywhere. How do you make these decisions about where you are going to put your coverage and where you're going to send correspondence? Unless you seem to have deep, deep pockets, deeper than most other news organizations, but every day you've got to make these big choices. You have reduced space because of your new format in the Guardian for actual the news hole is smaller. How do you take us inside? This is supposed to be a practitioner's discussion and, and so you know share with us what the what the difficulty is trying to cover the world, meet your budgets, not get your people killed, get them into places that are restricted, and and still find that your circulation is not dipping. How do you do all that? And we should point out Leonard doesn't have to worry about this much longer because he's about to become the Washington bureau chief, longest-serving foreign editor of nine years. Harriet's in her fourth year, so um, she still has this task. But you can you can be even more candid. Well, one thing that has become clear to us, and it's been a great blessing to the Independent as we've suffered kind of various budget crunches and all the rest of it, is that new technology, 24/7 electronic media you know, stuff on your cell phone, you name it, means that everybody's a foreign expert now. Everybody can kind of get it if they're, if they're interested. Um, my bosses at The Independent, you know, they, they're experts in the foreign world. So, so that, what that's brought about is, is a reluctance to do things, if I can just point it back to today's thing again, a reluctance to do things that are everywhere. So there's a big breaking story at 9 o'clock tonight, why put it in the paper, which will be out of date tomorrow? That's part of the argument we have for looking for these discussion things. And it makes our life simpler as well in that we can therefore ignore lots of breaking stories and just consign them inside the paper and try and devote ourselves to something that we think is agenda setting. So that's part of the... You're asking how do we kind of set about making the paper. That's part of it. You're kind of, you know, you've got the whole stream of news and facts and some of them are big, some of them are small. We're looking for things that are different, tonally different, visually different, driven by pictures, driven by ideas, and uh, capable of generating a discussion. And that's right through the paper. Um, Well, I think all the issues that John raised are really huge ones um, for all of us. I think that um, uh, in The Guardian... At The Guardian, we're um, much more fortunate than um, at The Independent because actually we are protected by our ownership structure. Um, We haven't faced such severe cutbacks as the independent has. We have a lot more correspondence than the Indy has. Um, But I'm still... Um, you know, I still uh, worry about whether we have people in the right places inevitably because, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, for example, we have five staff correspondents in America um, and only one in China. Um, and, you know, you might think that actually, given the changing world we're all looking at, that maybe we should move some of our American resources into Asia. Um, um, 
But, um, I mean, these are kind of big issues. Um, you know, although we've been um, less exposed to the kind of harsh, cold winds blowing through the British newspaper industry than the independent has, you know, we still don't have carte blanche to spend whatever we like. In fact, I mean, we, you know, we have to be very careful about what we, uh, what we spend our money on. Um, but that tends to be in terms of which stories we choose to cover, uh, what, uh, where we send people to and that kind of thing. And in a way, I mean, the other thing which is a massive issue um, for us and I think for everybody, although Leonard may not agree, is that, um, you know, the, the, the uh, John mentioned the fact that the space in the Guardian newspaper has shrunk, which is um, true. Um, but, you know, we have had a massive expansion in terms of our website and we're doing more and more stuff that um, goes on the Guardian website, which is a kind of fantastically big growth area for us. We're investing massive resources into it. This is kind of where we see the future um, for, you know, the, the Guardian and in particular for international news. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very lucky to, to have a very successful website and one that, that the... That, that the um, uh, Guardian's prepared to um, invest more money in and that, I think that's where you'll see kind of growth areas from now on um, I mean which doesn't mean to say that we're going to ignore or neglect the newspaper the newspaper is still fantastically important to us um, um, but I mean I could talk for hours about you know what I think the kind of role of um, foreign correspondents are but um, you know the truth is you have to I think it's really important to have people out there um, doing their own reporting and um, it's true what Len says we live in a 24-7 world in the sense that everyone can access um, an enormous amount of material on the internet and we can, you know, anybody in this room can access um, uh, newspapers anywhere in the world um, and we can all be experts but I mean I think that people do want some kind of guidance through that very uh, information rich world and I think that the Guardian or any newspaper um, can sort of provide it rather than people just having to deal with massive amounts of raw material. Your editors have quite different views, though, about the role of the web. Your editor, Mr. Kellner, has been much less enthusiastic about the supremacy of the web and podcasting and, and filing online. Um, obviously, your newspaper breaks stories first online. has uh, made a big issue of the fact that often you'll file first online. I mean... How do you, how do journalists, meet, where is it going? How much original reporting can, can reporters in the field, in bureaus, many of the people who've been in this, in this room have been in the field, can they meet all of those web deadlines, find original stories, not get themselves killed, and not uh, work themselves into a state of exhaustion? Well, I, I perhaps can talk a bit more freely yeah. about this because we, we kind of ignore a lot of that stuff. And we hear a lot of stories from Harriet's... Um, Harriet's staff about these um, things they have to carry around and they have to file their story and get this web thing going and do the podcast and it's a nightmare. Now, perhaps it's the, it's the new dawn and we're just missing it. Maybe that's true. But we are a newspaper and I think, if I can just perhaps be controversial for a minute, the, difference, the differences that are emerging is that we are about having a very tightly edited newspaper that's communicating some of the big major issues that are going on in the world in as coherent a way as possible with our readers. Personally, less is more in a newspaper very often. Having a fleet-footed, experienced journalist who can interpret a story, get to the place, is often a lot better than having three staffers squabbling about who gets the first byline, which is undoubtedly the case, and I've witnessed it myself in other better endowed newspapers, and it often happens. So there's a lot to be said for, uh, you know, a slimline model. There definitely is, provided it's tightly edited. And um, on, the, on the web issue, I mean, there is a serious issue here. Undoubtedly, you know, we will one day go, the way, go that way as well, but there is definitely an issue of distraction for journalists. You know, try and get a, try and get a print journalist to take photographs with some few exceptions. You know, they just don't want to know about it because it's distracting them from what they're trying to do, which is in itself a job. So likewise, when you've got the, rate the cassette recorder with you or the di digital recorder with you or the handy cam or whatever, you can readily kind of end up with a bad version of the wires. And this goes to the issue of podcasting. I mean, hands up who listens to the daily political brief from the Washington Post every day. It's appalling. It's like print journalists are not broadcasters. They're just not good at that, Paul. 
you know, the, the, give a print journalist a broadcasting job and it's execrable. And it's often execrable the other way around, I have to say, as well. So I think there are horses for courses. And uh, undoubtedly we have to, you know, the next generation will perhaps be more multi-skilled and multi-talented. And, but I think there are issues to think about there. It's going to be interesting, though, when you're on the receiving end as a Washington bureau chief, <laughs> when your reporters are being asked to do all these things, how you're going to respond. No, I am the reporter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not just going to be assigning stories. You're going to be reporting. So how is your, handi <laughs> how is your handicam work going? <laughs> no, well, we don't do, no, as I said, we don't, yeah. we don't, don't do for that. We just try and file too many stories a day by, by lunchtime. Um, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, uh, you know, a huge number of issues um, that we have to deal with, and I think that absolutely what The Guardian does not want to do is turn our correspondence into kind of wire reporters, because actually the um, wires and the agencies do that brilliantly, and what we need to do is kind of bring something that's kind of special, which is a, you know, a, a kind of particular Guardian take, and I feel very, very strongly that, you know, it's very expensive to have foreign correspondents based all around the world. Um, you know, they cost a lot of money, um, and actually you don't want them just sitting at their laptops all day long rewriting the wires. What you want them is out there doing original reporting. Now, you know, the thing is that I do think that it is possible to do additional material. Firstly, not everything can get in the paper. Um, there's far more stories out there than can fit into the allocated space in the paper and that you actually think are worth reporting and worth covering. So, I mean, you want to put those on the web. Secondly, um, you know, there are um, different ways of telling stories. I mean, the main way is by uh, um, reporting in a text form, whether it's in the paper or on the website, and that's what I think our journalists will continue to do um, and spend, you know, 80% at least of their time doing. But actually, Leonard is so wrong when he says that print journalists can't do, um, uh, uh, can't broadcast, can't do audio, um, because actually our foreign correspondents have shown that many of them are really, really brilliant at it. And actually quite a lot of them started out in life as radio reporters anyway, um, which helps. But, uh, you know, if you actually listen to, to our podcast or if you look at the the stuff that we're doing on the website now, which is kind of like, um, you know, lots of uh, slideshows with um, audio, voiceover, actually, they're really, really good. And it's got an added dimension. It tells a story in a different way. And I think that's what we're trying to do. We're in the business of telling stories in the best possible way. Now, I think, as I said, most of that time, it will be through the written word, whatever medium it's on. But actually, you know, there are visual ways of telling it. There are audio ways of telling it. We want to be open to exploring all those ways. We have to attract um, younger readers, a younger audience. The truth is that, you know, people under the age of 25 aren't really reading newspapers, certainly aren't buying newspapers, and we have to find ways of reaching those people. We have four and a half million people in the United States who come to the Guardian website because they can get something from the Guardian that they can't get in the American media on the whole. Um, which is a sort of slightly different perspective usually. Um, and, you know, we're keen to kind of to meet the needs of those people. And I, I know it's, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's, it's not just a brave new world, it's a very scary new world, and there's, there's, a, there's a danger of things, losing things as well as gaining things. But I think the kind of idea that you can stick your head in the sand and ignore the, the, the changing world that we're in is, is, is short-sighted. Uh, well, not sticking your head in the sand, but... A little story. Um, Frontline is a lovely arts program on, on, on BBC, and they have a podcast every Saturday where you can all Frontlines you've missed because you've been putting the paper to bed, you can catch up on a Friday. So I've done this a couple of times. It's a properly produced podcast. It's professionally done. <clears throat> the only trouble is that nobody listens to it because you can tell nobody listens to it because of all the horrendous cuts in the middle of it. And, oh, I'll take that again. Oh, yeah, I mean... It, it's clear that this is not being listened to. So is there a con job in the, in the podcast world? Is it just for the advertisers? Or are people really listening to it? Next point, who reads journalist blogs except their mummy? I mean, really? <laughs> is it just execrable? I mean, what's it all about? As foreign editor, are you, though, driving your, your journalists in the field to, to meet all these various deadlines, to meet the the podcast, to meet the blog, to file earlier, or are you trying to protect them from being nibbled to death by everybody else in your organization? Both. Um, you know, we're very keen to encourage all our correspondents to be very open to 
um, uh, new media to trying different things. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's definitely part of our, our, our strategy. But at the same time, I'm very conscious of the fact that you can't stretch people too thin because otherwise they don't do a very good job. And, you know, I think that it's about protecting people and prioritizing as well. So I think what you have to do is say, you know, what is the most urgent thing for a correspondent to do today and there's no prescription to that you can't be prescriptive about it, you can't say this is the blueprint, this is what they must do you know, if a big story happens, these are the five steps they must follow, first of all they must do they, they must file an instant file for the web, then they must do something else, I think you have to take everything on a kind of case by case basis and you say some days you're going to say actually the most important thing for our correspondent to do is to spend all day uh, talking to people, gathering original material and then spending quite a lot of time writing it into a kind of well-crafted piece that will run at some length that will be you know, read by lots of people and you will therefore want to protect them from instant updates. We have taken a decision that, that, you know, that, that actually unless it's very unusual circumstances our correspondents are not really in the business of, kind of constant updates on the web. We have people in London who do quite a lot of that um, because actually we think that the job of correspondents out in the field is to do original reporting and to kind of bring some kind of contextual uh, context to, to a story. Mr. Knightley, do you think you could survive in this 24-7 uh, environment? I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> My... The most important question to both of you would be simply this. How long will it be before you start to ask your correspondents in the field to carry a video camera as well? Uh, this is their notebook. And they will. How long before you ask them to become multifunctional and cover everything for every different form of media? Um, well, some of them are already doing that. Actually, we're not doing much in the way of video because I think video is particularly um, a sort of specialist skill. Um, but we now are training all of our correspondents to um, do um, uh, audio material and, um, you know, at kind of huge expense, we have flown every single correspondent back to London. Well, we did one lot in January, doing another lot next week um, to train them in these particular things. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they are going to be doing them all the time, but I just think that Actually, in the future, most journalists are going to um, have to have more than one skill, i.e. be able to do um, more things than, than, than just write a fantastic piece. But you have to recognize what people are good at. There are some people, some of our correspondents, who are the most brilliant correspondents, but actually can't take pictures, aren't very good at audio. That's fine. We're not going to sack them because they bring a hell of a lot to, um, you know, the thing that is The Guardian. Um, but, you know, we've also, over the past um, few years, hired some younger correspondents. In fact, you know, one of our most excellent multi-skilled journalists came from The Independent. <laughs> um, but, um, you that? know, Declan Walsh, who's, uh, who reports on Afghanistan and Pakistan, for us, who is, uh, you know, just sensational in the sense that he's a brilliant writer, he's a brilliant photographer, and he's also very good on audio and podcasting. Um, and I'm sure when he's trained will be a great um, video person as well. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that, you, you know, you, you do have to kind of consider all these things and balance them up. Um, but I just don't think that we can be in the business of saying, you know, we are just in the business of text, and uh, therefore, you know, we're going to close ourselves off to, to new media. One thing worth mentioning about The Independent is that we often say that we're the biggest newspaper in the world because so many of our talented young people get nicked by others, but we take it as a compliment and infiltrate the rest of the media. I, there is a big issue here, though, I think, that I think if you stop and think about what Harry is describing, the, the brave new world of The Guardian, The Telegraph, and all the rest of it, you're going to end up in a world where you're getting multitaskers. Now, there are exceptions like Declan Walsh, no doubt about it, and, the, and long may there be exceptions like him. But Robert Fisk doesn't do email. You know, he's not going to do email. So do we want a world whereby the putative foreign editor of another newspaper f sees a Fisk walking down the street and says, ooh, you don't do multimedia, do you? And uh, they won't hire him. They won't hire him because the advertising department will say, 
Where's the added value of Fisk? Okay, That's the well, big, uh, not finished. I mean, I you, think you won't get Alexander Coburn. You won't get Patrick Coburn. You won't get people. You won't get brilliant writers. The job of a newspaper journalist is just that, to be a brilliant writer. Now, if you can spin it off in various ways, fine, without messing around with the, with the actual product, that's great. But the minute you start asking people to encumber themselves with things that they're not happy to have, you've got problems. I mean, I absolutely take the point about Fisk. I mean, who is, you know, kind of a um, uh, uh, master of what he does, and uh, you wouldn't want him um, diluted in any way by trying to do many things. I mean, the, the one of the things is that, you know, luckily the Guardian, well, luckily for those of us who work for the Guardian, and I hopefully for its readers, we're not run by the advertising department, um, which means that we're not perhaps subject to the same pressures that you are. Uh, some other questions here, and then behind, and then... Here. Yeah, my, my name is Paul Milray. I have to declare numerous interests. I've now gone over to the dark side, and I'm a government spin doctor, so I'm the director of communications for the Department for International Development. But I was a Reuters correspondent for 20 years, and I just wonder whether we're seeing a split here. Uh, and I will tell a story about my time with the Guardian correspondent in Latin America, but a split between an attempt to follow the news and if you're going to have journalists multitasking, and I remember the time in Reuters when and I'm, I've had a front page cover of Nature magazine, uh, but you know I was, a, I was a scribbler. And the attempt to get us to do radio, to, I did a Sky interview with Fujimori, but you know, the attempt to get us to the fore meant we were stretched so thin that what we actually produced in pictures, in television, and in writing was just really not. All we're doing was churning out sausages. And, you know, Again, in Latin America, to be honest, you know, even then, when The Guardian was funding foreign correspondents a lot more, poor old Malcolm Code used to ring me up from Bolivia when the coup was in Peru and say, you know, can you tell me what's going on? And so, in a sense, what you've described is you've described journalists being expected to produce lots of things. But we've also had earlier on the issue about what's on the front page. What's on the front page is the latest story that everybody's following. So there is a tendency when you get people multitasking to, to flock towards that key story, that big story. Because if you're trying to attract the 18 to 25 year olds, you've got to get them busy. Whereas what, what you're talking about is a completely different product which says don't read the newspaper for the, for the news necessarily because you can get that on the television or radio. Read it for the depth of analysis and writing. Is, is there a split building up. Is there, a split? is there a split? Yeah. Okay. Let's take a couple others and we'll come back. Another, another comment, question, question, I hope. Hi, my name is Shelley Cooper and I'm a Guardian buyer of some in many years. And um, what I'd like to say is uh, when I buy the Guardian these days, um, the emotion of my heart as I go to purchase at the train station is curiosity. Um, and that's a, an emotion widely shared by my friends. And um, it's just that there's no sort of lie in these days. I mean, you're talking about the um, job of, you know, news management, getting news in the paper and all that sort of stuff, and I respect that, and there must be a very big job. But um, it's very confusing in, a, in a, a situation where the armed forces seem to be ill-used in many people's opinion. You know, the world's plunged in a chaotic situation. There is a suspicion that you uh, will not take a strong line because it's a Labour government initiated thing. I'd like to ask you if you identify with that. It is, amongst my friends, a widely spread view that The Guardian is these days curious. We continue to buy it, <laughs> We're not, but we do laugh. Um, I'd like your reaction to that. Okay. Well, let's take that one, then we'll come back to the split, which is kind of a larger question, a very specific thing. Well, if I can't hear you still buy it. Um, uh, um, I think that one of the things that we feel very strongly about is that um, there should be a, a, a division between news reporting and editorialising. Um, so I think that what we try and do is report what's happening. We try and approach stories in a kind of um, fair, um, with a fair and open mind, report what we find, um, put it in the paper, and actually we want our readers to make up their own minds. We don't actually want to tell our readers what to think in terms of our news reporting. Obviously we do editorials and we have, you know, fairly extensive comment pages um, where, you know, all these things are debated. But in terms of the news pages, um, 
we're not really in the business of being polemical or banging the drum from one side or another or taking up positions. I think people are perfectly capable of making up their own minds. What they need is the information to do that. And that's really what kind of um, drives the philosophy of the news pages of The, of the Guardian. Uh, while we're waiting for the mic, let's just get an answer to the question about the split. Is there a real split here and in the industry at large? I think in, in, undoubtedly there is because we have such a plethora of noises coming at us all day that you, know, you need somebody to kind of take you by the hand or disagree with you or guide you to it without being... I don't, I don't think we're being opinionated and putting comment pieces on the front of our newspaper, front page of our newspaper. But I think, you know, you're... The job of the journalist is to say what you see. So if you're in Iraq and you see, you know, mistakes, you say it. You don't have to balance it with a statement from the coalition forces and set that against a nice Iraqi man who thinks the opposite. We trust you. We trust the journalist implicitly, and we stick it in the front page. I mean, that's sort of the difference. I'm not saying we don't trust the Guardian doesn't trust their journalists at all, but I think there is a different model arising whereby we see that there is a very confused picture out there. Government is telling you lies. Military is telling you lies. Armed groups are telling you lies. Let's try and take a path through it, which won't always be right, but we hope it will help people come to a conclusion. Um, yes, I do think there's a split. I mean, I think there's a, I think there's a split in the sense that... Um, uh, uh, you know, I think the independent has decided very consciously and very um, uh, effectively and successfully for that paper to kind of go with very polemical front pages, very campaigning front pages to address a particular audience they've got about, you know, four stories that they, that they kind of um, stick with very assiduously, which are all very good issues um, and, you know, but are kind of quite... Um, as I say, polemical about it. I think we decided to do something different, which is to um, not kind of batter our readers over the head, but you know, try and give people the information to make up their own minds. I don't think that's the only split. I think there is also a split about um, the future and the future, you know, how we're going to kind of continue reporting the world. And you know, despite everything that um, Leonard says, I think that actually, you know, I'll go back to what I said. You know, I think we have to kind of find new ways of reading, uh, of reaching people. Um, we have to grow. Um, you know, we're trying to do that. We're trying to build ourselves as a kind of a global brand, which I think we're doing really successfully through our website. And I think the Independent has kind of hit on a very successful formula, but it's actually very kind of limited in terms of growth. Uh, you spoke about uh, truth and lies. We had you here last. Yes, my name is my name is Majid Tafreshi. I'm from University of London and Iranian News Agency, and I work for some other Iranian media as well. Uh, you spoke about truth and lies, and you spoke about the differentiation between uh, editorials and uh, coverage. Uh, I'm so sorry to ask this question from you too, because this question is more uh, related to other two uh, broadsheet newspapers. Uh, most uh, uh, of the coverage and editorials I've seen in the last two years uh, on Iran uh, actually mixed between editorial and the coverage. You cannot differentiate, especially, especially in Daily Telegraph. I had a research about one writer, 50 articles of one writer, a uh, famous writer, uh, his articles for Carl Cochlin. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. 41 articles without any source, without any traceable source, and two thirds of them uh, revealed to me lies on Iran. Uh, and all of them were editorials. I've got the list of them if you like, want. Uh, uh, what do you think about that? It, this, this is absolute fabrication about uh, the truth. I'm not saying that they are good or bad for Iranian government. M British media used to be very reliable. I used to read Guardian since I was 15 in Iran in this form of Guardian Weekly. Uh, I, I love that, and that was m my weekly job to read that. I still do read uh, British media, but it seems uh, when, you read, when you read 50, 60 articles in the terms of two years from one newspaper, one or I. Uh, or, uh, uh, journalist, you cannot say the lies was, wasn't intentional. 
you, you see lots of lies on that. I can list them. The last of them was two days ago in, about uh, uh, cooperation between Iran and uh, North Korean scientists uh, who left out of job after the deal with the United States. And if, if you go to the uh, source, you find a very well-placed diplomat. This is the only source. And one paragraph article, and the, the rest is background. Now, I think in fairness, since he's not here, what we'll do is we will give him, he'll be able to see this. We'll ask him to write something onto the web that responds to your... Sure. Your, your I already uh, wrote about it. I published that. No, but here, we have a chance mm. to okay. back to you. So and we can keep this alive. Sure. But it's, I think probably we shouldn't go beyond that since he's not in a position to defend his journalism. Mm. And I don't know if you want to... Well, just that. on the subject of Iran, I mean, probably the most shocking thing about the whole issue of the captive sailors and all the rest of it, I think, when you step back from it, is isn't so much that they were selling their stories to the papers, is that the papers, certain papers, were paying for stories. And it, I think we've got to talk about this a bit more in, in discussions about the British media. No other self-respecting media on the planet gets into this game of paying for stories. And it's kind of the, the, it's the dirty little secret or the dirty big secret, I think, in many respects. It's inconceivable that this could happen in the United States. It just does not happen. It doesn't happen in that form, but the people who are the bookers for magazine programs and talk programs have offer very many enticements in order to get guests from one to another, correct? You're nodding your head. Okay. So, I mean, it doesn't, but it doesn't exist in that form in terms of print journalism, but then what about the purchasing of memoirs and withholding of information when someone has an exclusive story and they've already got a book deal and they don't put it in the newspaper because they hold it. Talk about Bob Woodward holding information from the Washington Post because he has a big book deal, he doesn't publish it right away. Isn't that a variation of checkbook journalism? I think it's kind of a, it's a venial sin as opposed to a mortal sin. In, in the, in the, in the sin. <laughs> But the point is, I mean, it makes a mockery of the, of the Press Complaints Commission, doesn't it? Well, I just think the whole business of paying for stories is, is, is obscene. Uh, and unfortunately, people buy the papers and believe what they're reading is true. They don't, they don't get it that the person has been paid 10, 20, 30,000 pounds to say that. I mean, that's where it's, it's a complete abomination. It's just appalling. There's no, under no circumstances would you pay for a story. Absolutely. We couldn't pay anyway. If you yeah, wanted to. <laughs> Our policy is we don't pay for stories. Anything more you want to say about the, uh, the situation in terms of the Iranian coverage? In terms of, we don't have the tabloids here. This shouldn't be too worthy. So if there's anybody representing, by the way, the Telegraph or a tabloid or who would like to sort of defend um, the handling of those stories, please speak up. Ask the question. We don't want to be this, this, this to be, as I say, overly worthy. No one wants to say anything. <coughs> Um, any other questions on these issues before we move on? Thank you. Hello, my name is Bobby Pathak. I'm a freelance journalist and a um, documentary maker. For my sins, I'm a former tabloid news reporter. Um, I'm sort of curious. I'm going to ask a mischievous question. And I'm kind of curious because, Harriet, you both, and also Leonard, you're both coming from different angles here, but you're talking about the altruism and the weight and reach of journalism. Harriet, you're talking about multi skill journalism, and you're talking about not diluting the quality of single skilled journal journalists. Well, how do you reconcile that altruism or the weight and reach when you are both representing the least read newspapers in Britain and you've, you've got to get people to read the newspapers. So how do you manage to fly behind that altruistic flag when actually it is about readership and people buying the papers? Uh, well, I think it's very, um, you know, I mean, the, the truth is that fewer people are buying papers and I think it's uh, a great shame and I think that we're facing a kind of crisis of journalism in this country because I think there's uh, you know, things that absolutely must be reported that are going on in the world um, and you, know, you want them to be read. I mean, you know, first of all, I mean, our solution to that is, of course, to grow our readership on the web and um, you know, th that's what we're doing. That's why we're investing so much money in the web and we're trying to um, find readers globally, which we're pretty successful at. 
Um, but you know, just going back to this point, it's, it's not just about um, you know uh, multi-skilling and stretching yourself thinly versus single skilling and kind of depth and context. You know, I would kind of fight to the death to um, say that the foreign correspondence of the Guardian must provide depth, provide context, provide original reporting, that actually it's not about stretching people thinly, it's about finding the balance. And that is a really, really hard thing to do. And it's something that kind of we struggle with every day, is that, you know, how do you meet the needs of both, um, you know, a kind of digital publishing um, set up, which is very fast moving um, and, you know, requires a lot of kind of resources and also doing what I think The Guardian is best at, which is kind of in-depth contextualised reporting. Well, what I say to that is that the world we're in is not about getting kind of more and more people on stories and being the first. It's all about thinking about stories. It's all about analysing them and looking at them and holding them up to the light and seeing the huge significance in some developing trend or breaking trend. So that's what we're trying to do. That's where we're trying to differentiate ourselves. And on the issue of readership, we may be the, the minnow in the, in, the, in the UK pond, but the independent group is owned by the Irish Independent in Dublin, which is the biggest selling paper there, owns the Belfast Telegraph, owns about something like two-thirds of the South African print media, same in New Zealand and a bit of Australia, and recently has purchased a third or half of the biggest circulation Hindi newspaper in India. So it's not quite, you know, the metropolitan goldfish bowl you think it is. So we have reached, not on the web as of this minute to the extent that The Guardian do, but we are all over the place in terms of syndication. And it is interesting, freelancers tell you this, that they don't get paid very well by the independent, but they really want to work for the independent because it opens doors for them around the world. Other newspapers, not The Guardian, but other newspapers which will remain nameless, they close doors on you because people perceive the paper to be prejudicial or obstreperous or difficult in whatever fashion, but for some reason the independent um, seems to have a different, uh, different footprint, at least in people's per perception. Question right there and then question right here. Hey, Michael Gill, can I do some bits of news research for a selection of non-profit organisations? The Berezovsky story today was a cracker, and it was also a cracker on Monday. The only thing I would say about the Guardian coverage is that on the web, when that story was by, I mean, some like 30 people died in that uh, killing on in, in Sunday evening. But on Monday evening, one of the main questions on the web that was being linked to by most bloggers is, is that they were asking, why did something like 30 people die in America, yet 129 people died in Iraq over that 24 hour period. The other thing is, is that you had a, a real cracker, a, a original hard hitting piece of investigative journalism today that had strong international implications and it was buried on the front page of the technology supplement. I mean, it was Duncan Campbell. Now, that guy's covered, has broken more major stories, real shocking stories over his time. So it really could have been done within the first five pages of The Guardian, really. Well, I, I'm ashamed to confess that I haven't read the technology supplement of the Guardian today, so I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, um, but um, in terms of the, I, I mean, the, sorry, the, the first question was about 32 people being killed in Virginia versus however many were killed in Iraq. I mean, this is, you know, this is going back to the debate that we've been having all week about, you know, why do we, why, why are we? I mean, when I say we, we collectively, the, the British media giving so much saturation coverage to events in Virginia and you know I think the answer is this kind of thing that what happened in Virginia was exceptional what apart from yesterday what has happened in Iraq this week is sadly tragically appallingly not exceptional it happens every day now that's not a reason for not reporting it and I mean I'm very happy to talk about the difficulties of reporting from Iraq and I know Leonard is too I know it's a subject that we that he and I have discussed many many times it's you know the kind of biggest difficulty I think that, 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 that we and our colleagues on other papers face um, but you know it, it was the two things kind of aren't really quite um, comparable we have, we're running out of time so we're going to have to move quickly here yes
Thanks very much. My name is Wyman Yoon, and I'm a Guardian reader, but I'm also a New York Times reader and a Washington Post reader, a journal reader. I read Dawn um, from Pakistan and The Hindu, and all of this is on the web. Now, given that I have access to all this information, and increasingly, albeit in the English language, um, and given the fact that this is only going to increase as more and more papers go on the web, what is the point of foreign correspondence? And forgive me for being slightly provocative here. Well, I, you can't do without them because um, most of the, many of the papers you talk about, I mean, we, the American papers have fantastic foreign correspondence, but developing world newspapers, by and large, don't because they're so expensive and so, you know, Sorry, I believe I wasn't making myself clear. If I can get the news from the source, from the country um, which I'm interested in, um, I, I, would, I would say um, it's great that someone like Declan Walsh is in Afghanistan covering um, uh, news from the Guardian point of view. Um, but I'd also like to see more local coverage, or rather local journalists giving me their points of view. Um, so I, I guess I'm just talking about foreign correspondence in an abstract fashion. I think people? the key thing is that foreign correspondents are not about news in its raw form. And, and we've all tried and, uh, uh, to use local journalists and do all the time, but they're writing to a different audience, they're writing to a different mindset. Um, the, the whole role of the foreign correspondent is to find something that's exportable, find something that has, that has resonance and is relevant and is interesting uh, because it's brand new or because it's familiar or it's a new twist in something to a reader in a, in, another, in, a, in a completely different place. And so it's not just a question of opening the tap and pouring out news. It's a question of filtering news and picking the stories that you think will work. For a British audience? For an, well, for an increasingly multinational audience or international audience. And I mean, just to go back to the um, Virginia story, is that, you know, the, I mean, obviously the New York Times and all the American papers threw massive resources at that story, but I mean, they didn't kind of uh, explore the issue of gun control, um, which the British press did. By the way, on the point of foreign bureaus in the United States, I just came back from New York, and the talk there at a frontline event we had in New York was the decline of foreign bureaus, the Boston Globe essentially shutting down most of their bureaus, the Los Angeles Times retrenching. So it's not a good trend in the United States. No, no, it's, and it's not necessarily a good trend here either, but um, and it's, it, it is incredibly expensive to have a foreign correspondent. I mean, you're talking about £150,000 a year kind of ballpark figure, which is quite difficult to justify for news which is considered not to be you know, of vital interest to the country quite often. I, we started talking about Alan Johnson and um, the concerns about his welfare. I want to I want to end um, talking about what must be the most difficult parts of your lives, and that is worrying about the safety of the correspondents you have out in the field and doing these difficult jobs. Let's just take what's going on right now in Gaza. Can you put a correspondent in Gaza, given the circumstances uh, and given what has happened to Alan? And if you can't, aren't you then having to give away, give up a story that needs to be told on the ground and from the perspective of those who live there if you celebrate the role of the correspondent? I mean, I think that's, I think it's a very difficult issue. I mean, security is a, a massive problem um, for, um, you know, people doing the kind of jobs that Leonard and I are doing. Um, as far as Gaza is concerned, I think one of, you know, I mean, obviously Alan's kidnap is a kind of, um, uh, terrible tragedy for, for him and his family, um, but I also think it's kind of terrible on own going for the Palestinians because um, I can't believe that the BBC will have a correspondent based in Gaza again. Maybe I'm wrong. As far as we're concerned, you know, I've talked to our correspondent um, in uh, who covers Israel and the Palestinian territories um, a lot over the past uh, five weeks and beyond, I mean before that too about the safety of reporting from Gaza we're very very reluctant to give up the idea that we can go and talk to Palestinians on the ground there about the um, particular um, horrors and deprivations they face um, but you know we are very safety conscious as well and we are we are devising strategies of going to Gaza but minimizing our exposure to risk. I mean this gets to the heart of the dilemmas and the questions which somebody sitting in, in the foreign editor's seat in any newspaper or media organization is confronted with all the time. 
on the one hand, you, you're kind of your instinct is safety and protection and all that, but you're not always going to get the liveliest stuff if that's your guiding instinct all the time. And your bosses are always got a twinkle in their eye and saying, you know, when is he over the wall or when is he going to put him, when are we going to get that, you know, that hunk of red meat that they can slap on the front page. Not necessarily stated overtly, but it's always that terrible tension that exists. Paul Wood, a great colleague of ours, you know, walked, if I recall correctly, over the hills into Kosovo at a time when everybody was saying, stay the hell out of there, the Serbs are killing everybody. I'm sure it was a decision he made by himself, for himself, but um, these are incredibly difficult decisions which have to be made all the time. And Gaza is... Is that a turning point, really? Because the if it is, if, if you know, if the worst is true, uh, and if there is an Al Qaeda type element operating in Gaza, then the rules are changing completely, and uh, there's a whole sea change happening on a story that we've become very well versed in reporting. Um, I, from what I understand, the BBC team who are on the case, you know, have armed guards and don't leave the Erez car park at the moment it is that dangerous, or it's perceived to be that dangerous to go into the country. So it's a very difficult time, and it's a very difficult subject for people in our, in our kind of position. It must be draining as well, just from a personal standpoint. Uh, I think it's very difficult. And I mean, I, you know, um, when you have a correspondent who you know is in a very risky situation, um, you know, you do worry all the time, and we try and keep in close contact um, with our people, you know, it's not just uh, Iraq, it's not just Gaza, you know, we've also, because we've all sent correspondence into Zimbabwe recently, that was kind of very worrying too, um, you know, there is a um, serious penalties for reporting uh, without authority in Zimbabwe um, and, you know, there's lots of other countries that are very dangerous too. So yeah, I mean, it's very, very worrying. I mean, you know, we had a correspondent who was kidnapped in Baghdad um, uh, 18, 20 months ago now, um, and uh, you know that was that was a particularly kind of ghastly time, mostly for him, but I mean also for those of us on the desk who felt responsible for having sent him there. I want to ask you about your responsibility to local journalists, and specifically, I want to talk about what happened in Afghanistan um, after the Italian journalist was released. We know that the interpreter journalist Ajmal Naqshbandi was was executed, and he never figured in to the negotiations. And the Afghan Journalist Association withdrew its services, stopped covering the Taliban for a week out of protest. At our forum in New York earlier this week, Elizabeth Rubin, the writer, challenged the international media there. She was talking about NPR and others, and asked the question, would you, in sympathy with local journalists who have had one of theirs killed, murdered, would you support that and not cover the Taliban for a week? Well, I think journalist strikes are kind of mad. The NUJ this week has decided to go on strike in in, uh, in Jerusalem because of what's happened in Gaza. I mean, it's nuts. You can't, I think just withholding your services, uh, it's just crazy. You don't do that. But there are real serious issues about the safety of the people who actually help foreign correspondents. They don't help them. They make it possible. Foreign correspondents can't operate without good drivers, good interpreters, good protection, whatever it may be. And when those people are in trouble, there's, there are very, very important issues here of uh, their humanity and their protection, which Western media, org media organizations tend to run a mile from. I know The Guardian is a big exception here, and, and The Independent, I think, also, uh, we absolutely try and look after and do look after um, fixers who get into trouble, get them out of the country, places like Iraq, places like Zimbabwe, where our reporter was uh, denounced in the British media, <laughs> and we had to get him out of the country because of some awful calumnies that were being spread about him. So we tend, and he's a local reporter, he's a Zimbabwean. And God forbid, if one of these local reporters is killed or maimed or whatever, do you, the Independent and the Guardian, take responsibility for... The the families of those journalists, those local journalists that don't have pension plans, don't have the benefits of um, journalists in the West? Well, we, in Basil and Petter's case, we have done. We brought his family out of Zimbabwe and supported him and continue to support him in, in Johannesburg. Um, well, I mean, I don't think we've 
quite been in that position, but when after our kidnap experience in uh, Baghdad, we certainly got all four of our local Iraqi staff out of the country for um, because they felt that they were at risk. So we paid for them and their families to leave and go um, to country of their choice, which um, was. Damascus, I think, um, and stay there for quite a long time until they felt it was safe to go back in. So, yes, of course you feel responsible. And on the issue of withdrawing your reporting in solidarity with local journalists in the I agree like with Leonard on that. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the prime, journalists' primary responsibility is to report on what's happening in the world, and you can't do that if you're kind of on strike. Okay. We're, we're coming up now uh, to 9 o'clock. We're, we're winding down here. Uh, but I think we have a couple. We have a time for a couple quick questions, if not long statements, questions. So, okay, hold on, just wait for a mic here, down here first. Thank you. Right. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> um, my question is, how many foreign correspondents do you have today compared to when you started four years ago and nine years ago? Uh, considerably less staff foreign correspondents, but an infinite number of uh, good freelance correspondents who feel like yourself. Um, that's the, that's the, the, the nature of it. Yeah. Um, we have about 10, 10 full-time staff correspondents. And how many did you have before, when you first started? Nine years when the independence started in 84, there were probably about 20 of them. Yeah. It was a much bigger paper then, and mm. it was a, you know, a broadsheet required far more resources, and it was a different way of in the news as we've been describing all evening. Yeah. Um, we've maintained a pretty steady number. Actually, I knew I'd be asked this question, so I wrote it down. Um, um, we've, got, we've got 24 full-time correspondents abroad, um, 16 on staff, 8 who are um, non-staff but working full-time for us. Um, and then, you know, as, uh, again, as Len says, we use stringers as well. But um, we've, we've kind of maintained um, the numbers, which has, you know, been great. The, the only reason I ask is that I think that that should be being expanded, not decreased. Because, yeah. <laughs> Any other quick questions? Yes? And I'm sorry, we'll get you right after that. Um, hi, my name is Natasha, and the question is uh, to you. Um, I was uh, I read an article, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you wrote it, uh, where you were wondering if it's still worth it to have... Um, uh, war correspondence. Do you still question that, especially now with all this, this turmoil? And um, I don't think I've ever written anything that says. Um, I know he was in the Guardian. I'm, I'm sorry if it's not you. But no, no, I don't think. I don't think it can have been me. I mean, I, I have said. Um, I think there needs to be more honesty about um, the difficulties of reporting from uh, Baghdad. Um, and um, I think there are kind of very serious questions that I know everybody takes very seriously and we talk about them all the time. Um, I think that sometimes we're not as honest as we should be about the, um, the real problems in actually kind of doing a proper reporting job. And, I mean, I have been on record as saying that, you know, I think that, but I mean, everyone, I'm sure Leonard would agree that, you know, that there's a, there's a risk-benefit calculation that you have to make is the benefit of being in a very dangerous situation um, worth the risk and you can't be prescriptive about that you have to make judgments actually the correspondents are the ones who really have to make the judgments because they're the ones who are on the ground who are facing the risk and who actually know the situation best um, but particularly um, after Rory Carroll was kidnapped in Baghdad I felt for quite a long time that actually it wasn't worth the risk. I never, ever want to see one of our correspondents killed. I mean, neither does Leonard. Um, but um, I, I kind of now, we now have gone back to Baghdad um, and we are there n not all the time, but fairly regularly um, under very specific controlled uh, conditions. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of horrible calculation to make. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, the big issue all the time is getting sued, getting somebody hurt, and getting somebody hurt way above getting sued. Um, th this is a thing which keeps you awake at night. Um, the need to be on the ground and to get the, to get the reporting, and at the same time, the need to keep that person safe. But I should also say that I think, by and large, you find that print journalism is a safer occupation than... Um, Photographic journalism. Photographers have to be there where the bullets are flying. Video people, people speaking to camera, are often far more exposed uh, in the run of things and, by and large, get hurt a lot more often. You know, that's not true, Leonard. Well, 
because the INSEE just completed a 10-year study of all the journalists killed in the past 10 years, and the number of print journalists killed is almost identical to the number of uh, journalists killed in broadcast. I'll stop even less now. My name is... We're running out, but let's take a couple of very quick questions. Uh, my name is Armel Khan, and I'm a freelancer. I was, wanted to ask both of you, out of curiosity, what are your plans for coverage of Iraq once the Americans and the British leave? Well, I mean, the presence of the Americans and the British is, is kind of sort of almost irrelevant to how we, we report the place anyway. Uh, Patrick Coburn will rarely go into the green zone, if ever. It's probably more dangerous in there than outside. Um, we will. We were opposed as a newspaper to the war in the first place, into the occupation, and the sooner they leave, the better. Actually, so perhaps we'll, do, we'll have more, a lot more coverage in the future. Will they be on your front pages? If it's dramatic enough, and if it uh, merits uh, our moniker as the newspaper, of course, it'll be on the front page. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we don't have any concrete plans for uh, when that's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. Um, but we are committed to the story, and I can't see that, that commitment uh, diminishing as a result of the coalition leaving. Hi, my name is Fiona Clary. I'm a student. Uh, just very quickly, uh, what extent do you collaborate on how you run a story or... Uh, never really, but um, <laughs> we will try and undermine each other and set false trails. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I once managed to get, uh, it's a good tip, is I managed to get uh, the, the retainer of a Guardian stringer doubled overnight by, um, by calling, yeah, this is in Zimbabwe, by uh, calling Andrew Meldrum at the time and uh, call, asking our correspondent there to go and see if she could find Andrew Meldrum. I needed to pass on the message to him. And that somehow worked, it, worked its way back to London, and he was, his deal was doubled overnight. <laughs> no, that's right. Guerrilla tactics is quite useful. <laughs> we don't collaborate on stories. I mean, the, the, I mean you know, over the issue of security, um, you know, we have talked about um, what the problems are and how to deal with them, and we do kind of share information on that because I think that in those circumstances – Collaboration is more important than competition. If you're talking about the um, safety of, of correspondence, but on, on on stories, I'm afraid, sadly, we don't. But you find that the correspondents, uh, without telling us, collaborate all the time in the field. <laughs> Was there a question right behind? Did you have a question? No. Then the last question will go right here. Hi, my name is Mark, and I'm an MA photojournalism candidate at London College of Communication. And my question is, is sort of uh, your motivations for using that Alan Ken photograph of the, the massacre in Virginia Tech, and as far as the layout was concerned. Because uh, I noticed in the, on The Guardian it was used mainly as a panorama. As already is, it was a, or tightly cropped as it was. This was several days ago. And whereas you guys ran it, both spreads, front and back, and the pixelation was almost, it was very pixelated because it was blown up so much. So I was just wondering about how you came to those decisions. And also, maybe a bit prosaic, but on the use of an article, massacre on the campus versus massacre on campus. Oh, yeah, we did, we did have almost identical headlines on that day. Um, I mean, actually, I'd say on both these questions, I'm not the person to ask because, I mean, you know, questions about um, use of photography, we, we talk a lot, and I'm involved in discussions about whether we should use certain types of pictures, whether, you know, particularly when you're talking about um, uh, very gruesome pictures, dead bodies, that kind of thing. But in terms of kind of crop and that kind of thing, I mean, I'll leave that up to the people who are experts on it. And again, you know, on headlines, um, I don't, was it? I think it was us who used the uh, the, the definitive. The, um, but I mean, that's probably for completely insane reasons. Like we needed to fill out the line, um, whereas you know maybe on the independent being a tabloid format, that was just sort of slightly tighter space, so they dropped it. Being a compact format, the the the, the issue of the um, of the picture. I mean, what, what we did is we could have wrap around wrap around picture that time and. Uh, that's why it was probably more pixelated. So, what, I mean, what, 
If there's a di- this was a, just to conclude, really, if there's a difference between the two of us, I suppose, is that The Independent is trying to be Newsweek every day or The Economist every day if you're high-minded about it. Uh, and I disagree fundamentally with Harriet Slur, which I let pass, that we just have four stories that we bang on about. <laughs> What we, what, what, we do, what we do, I think, is we identify some key stories and uh, within which there are a myriad of different uh, developments. Finally, coverage in your nine years that you're proudest about as a foreign editor, at least in terms of the performance of your journalism, a story that you're the, you wish that you'd done better or a story in the world, in part of the world, that you feel you've done badly in terms of covering. Both of you. Nine years and your four years. Um, uh, well, um, I think the stories that I'm proudest of um, are the war in Lebanon last summer where we did chuck massive resources at it and um, you know, kept going day after day and gave it lots of coverage and we had a brilliant team on it um, and that was a kind of great moment. I also think that the tsunami was another moment where, um, you know, I was kind of proud of our coverage and I was also proud of the fact that we kept with it and for a whole year um, after the tsunami we kind of, we went back to the same village every six weeks or so to see how the reconstruction was going and that was showed a kind of commitment to the story. I mean, you know, the stories that we failed on are kind of numerous um, and um, there's lots and I think one of the things about um, in this working in this business, doing this job, is that, you know, there's always things that you wish that you could have done better. Putting a newspaper together, you know, is done in a tremendous rush. It's not a kind of perfect thing. Um, And, you know, every day I wake up and think, um, I wish I'd done something better. I wish I'd taken a different decision. There's there's no such thing as a kind of perfect paper. There's lots of stories that I think we've, that we haven't done as well as we could have done. Well, it's an unfair question because the memory plays tricks on you as to what you did but one story uh, does stand out to me as being a seminal story and one which probably is a a hallmark of the independent and it's the story that Robert Fisk wrote on the day they pulled down Saddam Hussein's statue in which he said in his last sentence in in that story that this is the day the insurrection begins and that if we try and do anything I think that's what we're all about all all of the quality newspapers is trying to identify the deeper trends which enable people to have a broader understanding of it. The failures are too many to mention, so I'm not going to mention any of them. Uh, Thank you, Harriet, very much. And uh, Leonard, thank you, and good luck um, in Washington. Thank you very much.